our profession. Sachs' motto and its emblem are representative of its dual mission, to help maintain peace on our terms, and if deterrence fails, to counter aggression with devastating retaliation. 1960. The voice is General Thomas Powers, chief of the Strategic Air Command, spelling out the task of America's small force of short-range nuclear-tipped missiles. Then just coming into the force, the first intercontinental ballistic missiles. First of Sachs' operational ICBMs is the Atlas. The intercontinental ballistic missile can deliver a nuclear warhead to a target over 5,500 miles away in some 30 minutes. The Atlas had the range, but it was so inaccurate that it could only hurl its single large warhead in the direction of Soviet cities. Still, along with Sachs bombers, it served its purpose. The unmatched combination of Sachs' unique organization, its weapon system, continue to be the free world's most convincing argument for peace. For only the threat of devastating retaliation can keep potential aggressors from starting a nuclear holocaust. Devastating retaliation was the only option the Air Force had, but it wasn't one its officers liked. Soldiers don't get any pleasure out of killing civilians. All of their uh, objectives are to try to attack the military or the infrastructure of an organization they're, that they're at war with. The idea is not to kill all the people in a given nation, but to render that nation unable to continue the war. 1970, and the new Minuteman III brought the Air Force closer to its dream of being able to disarm the other side. The missile's three warheads could each be sent to different targets, and it was more accurate than the older ICBMs. Accurate enough to threaten Soviet Missile Command bunkers, perhaps even Soviet missiles themselves in their protective silos. And there were other targets for more accurate missiles. From early in the nuclear age, the U.S. and its NATO allies have planned to use nuclear weapons in the face of an unstoppable Soviet invasion of Europe. Missiles able to pick off military targets, like tank staging areas, made that policy more believable, or so it was argued. We had to be able to employ nuclear weapons against a so hypothetical Soviet attack in such a way that would not lead logically to the destruction of American cities. And therefore, it must avoid, logically, the destruction of Soviet cities, which would inevitably set off such a Soviet response. So began the concept of a limited nuclear war, in which only military targets would be attacked. The improving technology of ICBMs made possible a change in strategy. No longer need nuclear deterrence be based on an all-or-nothing response to Soviet aggression. The question then, and now, was whether a limited nuclear war would stay limited. Some people feel that escalation is, is immutable, that it will happen no matter what if the other side is well equipped. Uh, most of us, military commanders, cannot afford to think that. We must concentrate on how to, to fight a limited nuclear war because we don't want to have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just because we can fight total nuclear war, we want to make damn sure that that isn't the only thing we can do or we'll take us to that Armageddon uh, as sure as the Lord made little green apples because there's no other way. So we must have alternatives to total nuclear conflict, and we do have and we practice them. Uh, whether they'll work or not, nobody knows. Despite, or arguably because of this uncertainty, the United States announced a change in its nuclear targeting policy in January 1974. The intent is, is more effective deterrence of the possibility of strategic warfare 
because it is known by all parties that the President of the United States has options other than the devastating option of going against uh, the cities on the other side. At that time, we really did not have the capability to do the kinds of things that our new philosophy specified. Our new philosophy demanded high accuracy and a large number of uh, weapons to attack the various crucial targets with minimum collateral damage and with sufficient force to penetrate the hardness of those, of those targets. Uh, I recall that uh, Secretary Schlesinger said, by the way, our new policy is not going to be an excuse for you guys to go out and ask for a whole bunch of new capability. But new capability was exactly what the Air Force felt it needed. Its 550 Minuteman 3s of the total 1,054 missile ICBM force just didn't add up to enough warheads to target all the new Soviet missiles that had begun to appear by 1975. The missiles included the awesome SS-18, equipped with 8 to 10 warheads. Just as bad, in the Air Force's view, was the way the new missiles were being deployed in silos so hardened with concrete and steel that they'd need an almost direct hit to destroy them. We had to have some more warheads. We also hoped that we could get a better warhead with better accuracy. And that was the, the, the real rationale for going into the, uh, the MX. The MX, then on the drawing board, was to be the Air Force's answer to the new Soviet deployments. Like the Soviet SS-18, it would have 10 warheads, but the missile's real strength was to be its accuracy. At its heart was a super-sophisticated gyroscope. Test of the guidance sphere on a rocket sled showed it could withstand the forces of launch and deliver each warhead to within a few hundred feet of its target, close enough to destroy even a hardened Soviet silo. Such accuracy would transform the nuclear age, putting land-based missiles on a hair trigger. Before super accuracy, each side's missiles were essentially invulnerable. There was no point in shooting first. Massive retaliation was guaranteed. But accurate missiles, pointed at the other side's accurate missiles, might tempt one side into striking first. One missile, equipped with multiple warheads, can destroy several opposing missiles still in their silos, unless that side shoots back as soon as it realizes it's under attack. You're going to detect that attack with at least 27 or 28 minutes of warning. Check your combined display, two. You're going to know precisely the weight of that attack in 15 or 16 minutes. You're going to be able to make a decision to launch these missiles uh, in, say, five or six minutes. Good. Enter the valve, please. And you're going to be able to launch the missiles in one or two minutes. And the missiles are going to be launched. And I know that, and the Soviets know that, and I know they know that. That's a dialectic contradiction for you. On the one hand, I increase the accuracy and power of my offensive weapons, but on the other hand, my probable adversary develops a system that accurately pinpoints my ability to deliver a surprise first blow, so I lose the element of surprise. I can't deliver a strike which wouldn't be detected early on, and so the adversary, aware I'm preparing a first strike, launches his missiles from their silos. So both strikes turn out to be counter-strikes. And the missiles would meet and pass each other on the last stretch of their trajectories near the targets. So why deliver the first strike if both us and the enemy would launch missiles in anticipation of the attack? That's the delicate balance of terror. No matter how difficult it is for us to, to, to assess and react, he must take into consideration how difficult it is going to be for him if we do. 
A launch under attack policy, the only way to keep vulnerable missiles from being destroyed, places enormous responsibility on a nation's early warning systems. Too great a responsibility in the view of most Pentagon experts. Such a plan is, is fraught with danger. One has terrible worries about, about uh, whether our uh, warning systems would give warning if an attack were underway. You have perhaps even greater worries about a false alarm. And you have to recognize that decisions on launch under attack would have to be made by fallible human beings in a moment of incredible stress and in a very short period of time. The national position has been, as long as I remember, and still is, that we should have the technical capability to launch under attack, but we shouldn't depend on it. We wouldn't have to depend on it if missiles weren't sitting ducks in easily targeted silos. What, for instance, if missiles could move or hide? The Air Force had earlier explored the idea of trundling missiles around on the nation's railroads so they couldn't be targeted in a surprise attack. The plan was soon abandoned as impractical. But when the MX was proposed in the 1970s, the question of how it should be based became the critical issue, not so much to the Air Force, which was more interested in its extra accurate warheads, but to Congress when it debated the Air Force's request for development funding. In 1976, when we first came to grips with the MX, the issue of whether we ought to build it in order to make our own missile force survivable, which then put the emphasis on the basing scheme, or whether we ought to build it in order to threaten their missiles and, in the judgment of many people, lead us to a hair trigger on both sides, uh, was at the crux of the matter. This debate shaped the arguments for the dawning age of large, accurate missiles. What was more important for effective deterrence? The ability to threaten the other side's missiles or the ability to strike back if attacked? Being able to fight a limited nuclear war or, if nuclear war starts, to assure Armageddon. The Air Force was itself divided on the importance of making its missiles able to survive an attack. On the one hand, it was actively conducting tests on air-launched ICBMs, flying missiles around to keep them safe and launching them from parachutes if needed. On the other hand, most in the Air Force felt a simple silo was the best way to base the MX, because that was the quickest way to get the missile into service. Congress objected. The Congress said back loud and clear in writing to the President and the Air Force, we don't want to move to the next stage of development of the MX unless you can find a way of basing our missiles survivably. That's the problem we want to fix. But it was a problem that wasn't easy to fix. This quarter-scale model MX was being used to test a survivable launch system. The Air Force originally planned to simply slip the missile into a converted Minuteman silo and eject it with a blast of steam. But if the MX was to be survivable, the whole system would have to be able to move. Well, the MX was not the right missile to make move. It was too big, it was not designed as a mobile missile, and to make it mobile, we had to create a monstrosity. But if making the MX mobile was to be the price of congressional approval, well, the Air Force would go along. It began testing a basing scheme that would involve digging an enormous trench across the deserts of the Southwest, a trench that would eventually run for thousands of miles. A concrete tunnel would be built in the trench. The MX missiles would lie flat on rail cars and run up and down the tunnel on tracks. Since the Soviets wouldn't know where in the tunnel the missiles were, it couldn't target them. Then, if the missiles were needed, they'd break out through the roof of the tunnel their launching tubes rearing into firing position. Already becoming a technological monstrosity, the scheme got more and more complex. For instance, a giant transportable plug had to be invented to stop the blast wave of a Soviet hit anywhere in the tunnel from sweeping along its entire length. Ironically, 
At the time the Air Force was testing its solution to the problem Congress had told it to fix, the danger of a Soviet first strike, the Soviets didn't yet have the missiles to launch one. Let me say the SS-18 and SS-19 were not developed as first strike systems. At that time, they just couldn't be used for that purpose. These missiles are very powerful. They carry a very large nuclear warhead, but their accuracy was very poor. As a missile man, I can tell you that their accuracy was one order lower than that of the American missiles. Soviet engineers were even then working on improving the accuracy of their missiles. But most Western analysts saw them as continuing to pose little first strike threat. A group of outside intelligence experts called the B team disagreed. The B team in 76 warned that uh, there would be far more rapid advances by the Soviet Union in the number of MIRV reentry vehicles and in the accuracy of those vehicles than the intelligence community then projected. We felt that there would be a window of vulnerability uh, by the early 1980s. The idea of a window of vulnerability is that a Soviet strike wipes out the only U.S. missiles accurate enough to attack military targets. Absent the MX, that meant the Minuteman 3s. With only inaccurate missiles left, like those then on submarines, the U.S. could strike back only against Soviet cities. Rather than risk the inevitable counter-strike against U.S. cities, the president might choose to surrender. It's a highly theoretical argument. For instance, even a Soviet strike at U.S. missiles would kill millions of people with fallout and itself invite massive U.S. retaliation. But the window of vulnerability argument added new voices to those who wanted a survivable missile. In the Washington of January 1977, however, all arguments for the MX fell short of their target. Jimmy Carter came to office dedicated to arms control and opposed to the MX. The missile's accuracy and warfighting potential repelled him, and its survivability wasn't important if the intelligence community, the B team accepted, saw no imminent Soviet first strike threat. Carter administration came in 1977 and not only ignored the B team report because it conflicted with what it preferred to view as reality, it intentionally threw the B team report out. The MX almost went with it. What saved it was a technological breakthrough in the Soviet Union. In mid-1977, tests began of SS-18s equipped with a new guidance system. When more sophisticated guidance systems were installed on the SS-18, we discovered to our surprise and to the horror of the Americans that the missile could be used to deliver a first strike. U.S. monitoring stations quickly discovered the bad news. What had been only a theoretical nightmare suddenly became real. The evidence suggested that this modification was to make about a two-fold increase in accuracy in the missile and that that would achieve a level of accuracy with the size of the warhead on that missile, which could indeed pose a substantial threat to our missiles in their silos. And so that took the vulnerability issue from the back burner and moved it up to the front burner. And that meant taking a new look at the MX. The Air Force had been doing Congress's bidding in looking for a survivable basing mode, but with little enthusiasm. Now, however, the missile's potential survivability became its biggest selling point. The trouble was, the buried tunnel scheme was looking worse and worse. The Air Force put a team together, headed by General John Toomey, to look for alternatives. Many of my soldier friends would come to me and say, I don't understand how you guys could possibly work two years on finding this concept. He said, I've got the solution. You get these trucks, you put the missiles on the trucks, and then you drive them around the streets of America. The Soviets could never know where they're going to be. And that sort of thing is an, e an example. In fact, Art Buchwald had his, his, his solution was Amtrak. We know they'd be safe on Amtrak because nobody knows where Amtrak is at any given time. They're never on time, and their locations are unknown. 
and and that's obviously uh, pro that, that's not obviously but it's probably a workable scheme except that it violates one of the fundamental constraints is we don't think the american people are going to tolerate having uh, 10 megatons of nuclear weapons driving down the railroad tracks in the center of town and pulling into Union Station. Toomey's favorite solution was based on the old shell game. The idea was to build a group of simple, inexpensive silos, then move one missile around among them at random. Since the Soviets wouldn't know which silo held the missile, they would have to target them all. Again, blast tests were done to see if the silos could withstand near misses. But for Jimmy Carter, the question remained, why bother with the MX at all? He didn't share the Air Force's desire to add several thousand accurate new warheads to the nation's inventory. And if the only reason for the MX was to ensure the survivability of our deterrent, well, there were the submarines. The new Trident submarines were to get multi-warhead missiles that would give the United States all the retaliatory firepower it needed. If it was so hard for the Air Force to find a basing mode as survivable as the Navy's, why not simply abandon the land-based leg of the strategic triad and leave deterrence to the subs and bombers? I would say the pivotal argument for proceeding with the MX was that when the president asked Carol Brown and asked myself the critical question, which is, can you assure me that not just today, but 10 years in the future or 20 years in the future, that the submarines will be as invulnerable to attack as they are today? The answer was no, we could not assure him of that. So the president then perceived the specter that if he then narrowed his strategic forces down simply to submarines, and then if the Soviets were to make a breakthrough in submarine detection, so that submarines could now be discovered at sea, now you have the most vulnerable system of all, because there's nothing more vulnerable than a submarine if you know where it is. I've only got one life to live. But there was another powerful reason for Carter to build the MX. I will never have a chance so momentous to contribute to world peace as to negotiate and to see ratified this SALT treaty. He was about to sign the SALT II Arms Limitation Treaty, and he needed the support of his pro-MX Joint Chiefs of Staff to help get the treaty ratified in the Senate. This negotiated treaty. In June 1979, a week before he was to sign the SALT II Treaty, Carter reluctantly gave the go-ahead to the MX missile. There was just the little problem of its basing mode. How is it going to be based? That will be determined later. That, has not, that decision has not yet been made? No, it's in the process of being made, but the president will decide that in the course of the next several weeks. There had been disagreement over the proposed missile size. The Air Force wanted the biggest missile allowed under the new SALT treaty, so as to threaten as many Soviet targets as possible. But for those trying to design a survivable basing mode, a smaller missile was preferable. It would be easier to move around and hide. The big missile proponents won. Bill Perry was on the losing side. I have always believed, but I couldn't prove, that the, the, the biggest factor that led to the big missile argument was the uh, anti-wimp factor, which is that uh, it seemed like a wimpy thing to do to build such a little bitty missile when the Soviets had these big, uh, manly missiles. The choice of the big missile further complicated the basing mode problem. The shell game involved constantly taking the missile out of one silo and moving it to another. It was hard enough getting the much smaller Minuteman in and out of its silo. And when you start moving around something that weighs 200,000 pounds and is approximately 100 feet tall, it gets rather difficult, it gets cumbersome, it's unesthetic. And there was another problem with the shell game. The new SALT treaty would require that each side be able to count the other side's missiles by spy satellite. How could the Soviets know how many MXs there were without also knowing where they were? The answer was yet another basing scheme, the racetrack. The new plan kept the missile horizontal and used a giant transporter to shuttle one missile around among 23 shelters arranged in a loop. Periodically, the roofs of all the shelters would be open simultaneously, 
so that a satellite could verify there was only one missile per loop. Then, with all the roofs closed, the transporter would whisk the missile at high speed to any one of the other 22 shelters. The response to that system was really the response to every MX basing scheme that's ever been made, is there must be a better way, go back and find it. So we thrashed around for maybe another six months looking at alternative schemes, and if that one was Rube Goldberg, you should have seen some of the other schemes we looked at. But this time we dug in our heels and came back and said, no, this is the right way to do it. This is the best we can do. Called for a meeting of the National Security Council on the subject, got the meeting, and to make a long story short, it was approved. At the time that I made the decision to build the MX. On September 7, 1979, President Carter announced that 200 MX missiles would be built and deployed in a complex of 4,600 shelters in the West. To survive an attack. It's a system that America needs and will have for its security. I'm confident that the American people will support this deployment. Finally, the MX was on its way. The Air Force began surveying the deserts of Utah and Nevada to prepare for deployment, pleased it would at last get its big, accurate missile. And those more concerned with missile vulnerability were happy the MX would be hidden in over 40,000 square miles of desert, safe from attack. The experts and the politicians were on board. Now the MX was to meet the American people. Well, the one MX that uh, site or cluster or pod or whatever we choose to call it would have been built just beyond this black cinder cone there is on the horizon there. And of course it would have been just that close in proximity to the ranch. And then the railroad would have been built up entirely up the valley, coming out on up the valley here. Cecil Garland, a veteran of World War II, ranches in western Utah. As we're drilling a series of he attended one of the earliest meetings at which the Air Force explained their plans to the local people. To the levels and the actifers. No, I haven't seen so much brass since the Battle of the Bow. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to come, come hell or high water, and they don't care what they're going to do to my desert where I live. It's an invasion, an encroachment law, and I can't talk to these people. A lot of people here tonight, I think, believe it is a foregone conclusion that no matter what they say or do, MX will be built in Utah, even if there is opposition from the people. Well. The ultimate decision to deploy MX is a, a certainly a, a national decision which will take into account the feelings and the attitudes of the people in the deployment area. And of course he kept, you know, telling us that uh, this was good for us. And in spite of all our suspicions, concerns and worries and cares about our land or water or ranches and the valleys and our way of life, still this was good for us. And just relax and enjoy it. And the more that they tried to reassure us, I guess the more concerned and suspicious we came. I'm Major Bill Clapper of the Ballistic Missile Office. Most of the local opposition focused on environmental and social concerns. But the more the system itself and the way it was supposed to work was explained, the less the people liked it. An Air Force film didn't help. So to be sure of destroying that one missile and its 10 deadly warheads, an attacker will have to destroy all of its shelters. That means a minimum of 23 of their most accurate warheads to destroy only one missile. And the MX force will have 200 missiles. If the Utah people didn't like 4,600 warheads pointed their way, they were also suspicious of the MX itself. MX was not a defensive weapon. It was a first strike weapon. And we know this was so because it had terrible accuracy. Uh, the military said that it had surgical accuracy, whatever that is. There's a paradox in the idea of an accurate, survivable missile. Suppose it did survive a Soviet first strike. What would its targets be? The silos the Soviets launched their strike from would now be empty. And if there were missiles left, Soviet commanders would certainly have their fingers on the button in anticipation of any U.S. counterattack. Stop MX! Stop MX! Stop MX! 
It seemed to the growing band of MX opponents that the elaborate basing mode for the MX was window dressing to hide the real purpose of the missile, to strike first against the Soviet Union. Live from Symphony Hall in Salt Lake City. The MX debate went national in early 1980 when Bill Moyers chaired a live two-hour debate on public television. There were panels of experts and four local citizens, including Cecil Garland. Would you like to put to any one of these three? I had the statistics about land and water and cattle and grazing and all wrote down, and I was going to talk about that. But the more I heard uh, from the world's great experts on how to kill uh, millions and millions and millions of the people of this earth uh, with the least cost and expense and the most efficiently, I guess I sort of became repelled by the, the whole idea and I just threw my statistics away and I said, uh, it seems to me that this discussion has de degenerated into uh, how we should deploy the missile of the three modes. The land mode or the sea mode or the air mode. And I'd like to suggest fourth mode. I call it the car mode. <laughs> To the dismay of the Air Force, its carefully crafted plan for the MX was becoming a national joke. Cecil, Cecil. In an attempt to make the scheme a little more practicable, the need for the missile to dash at high speed between shelters was eliminated. Instead, a more stately but still immense transporter would move the missiles between shelters. But because the shell game could now be played only slowly, it was more important than ever to keep the real location of the missile secret. We looked at every possible espionage method that the Soviets could use, from satellites to agents riding around the desert in Winnebago's, uh, crammed with electronic gear. And in fact, the Air Force had done the same thing and uh, had decided to, instead of leaving the shelters that didn't have an MX missile empty, instead they were going to put a dummy in, that dummy that official name for the dummy was the, a mass simulator. And so in each cluster of 23 shelters, there would be one MX missile and 22 mass simulators. And what we found is that gradually we learned that you had to make that mass simulator look more and more like a missile. You had to, for example, paint it with the right paints because paints have an odor that can be detected with chemical sensors and so forth. So that this thing smelled, looked, tasted and behaved in all ways like an MX missile, and that was pretty complicated and I guess ultimately got rather bizarre. Most of the complications arose from the proposed SALT II requirements that the Soviets be able to verify how many missiles the U.S. possessed. SALT II was anathema to most conservatives, who were then rallying around the presidential candidacy of Ronald Reagan. One of Reagan's major campaign issues was the window of vulnerability. We have let our ability to defend ourselves be reduced to the point that there is what the military now calls a window of vulnerability through which that imperialistic power could one day issue an ultimatum. But while Reagan campaigned on the window of vulnerability, he was cool on the Carter administration's solution to it. The plan that has been submitted is going to, if I understand it correctly, require about 4,000 miles of tunnels and trenches in which those... And tracks. Yes, in which those missiles would maneuver. That seems a kind of a Rube Goldberg idea to begin with. Tremendously costly and can't be implemented for quite a number of years. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. January 1981, and again the MX was in the balance. But I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Carter had chosen a missile system with the emphasis on survivability and SALT II compliance. But by now, SALT II was declared dead. And to Reagan, the Carter basing plan seemed likely to deny the nation the MX's extra nuclear clout for too long. Because through all the debate on where to put it, the missile itself had been progressing well. All four stages of the missile were successfully tested. And development of the warheads and guidance system was also on schedule. 
So why not cancel the Carter basing scheme and come up with something simpler that could get the MX into service more quickly? Ironically, the Air Force, which had originally championed exactly this view, now grew seriously alarmed. We felt that we had forged a, uh, a fragile but still workable consensus in the Congress and among the people uh, in the states that were affected and among all of the strategic thinkers who had gone through all of the agonizing list of alternatives which we had examined. Therefore, it was uh, disappointing and disconcerting to have all of that unravel uh, so quickly. We fought uh, very, uh, very strongly against strong Air Force support for this plan for about nine months. And uh, we told them in the beginning we weren't going to do it, and uh, we didn't do it. This program will achieve three objectives. On October 2nd, 1981, President Reagan canceled the Carter basing plan. But an expert panel had been unable to come up with an alternative. There was only one option. Put the MX back in the silos it was originally designed for. We will complete the MX missile, which is much more powerful and accurate than our current Minuteman missiles. And we will deploy a limited number of the MX missiles in existing silos as soon as possible. After six years of searching for a survivable basing mode, the MX was literally back where it began. There is or will be a window of vulnerability. Why is the MX any less vulnerable if it's in silos, the location of which the Soviets presumably already know, unless we were going to launch on their attack? I don't know, but what maybe you haven't gotten into the area that I'm going to turn over to the, <laughs> to the Secretary of Defense. Because the silos would be hard to Yes. I could say this. The plan also includes the hardening of silos so that they are protected against nuclear attack. Now, we know that is not permanent. We know that they can then improve their accuracy, their power, and their ability. But it will take them some time to do that, and they will have to devote an effort, uh, a decided effort, to doing that. So this is the way, then, of buying time, sir? In a way of narrowing that window of vulnerability. The man who'd helped invent the window of vulnerability was disappointed. The candidate who campaigned on the window of vulnerability not only did not proceed to close that window of vulnerability, but open it wider. The deepest concern, of course, that the Air Force had was that in the absence of a basing mode, uh, we felt that the Congress, uh, well, or any, <laughs> uh, many thinking people, would simply not be in favor of the MX system at all. Lou Allen's concern was well-founded. Congress, which had demanded six years earlier that the MX be survivable, had since paid little attention to the missile. But now, on Capitol Hill, even pro-defense senators like Henry Jackson began asking awkward questions. The system is not survivable as proposed. Senator, I don't uh, think that at this point uh, there is anything that you can guarantee is going to be perfect. Uh, and what we need to do is to get the uh, added strength that we can get as quickly as we can, and meanwhile, start the search for something that is even better. Congress reacted to silo basing as it had in 1976. It turned it down and ordered the administration to come up with something better by December 1982. And it was then, from out of the blue, that what seemed like the perfect basing mode suddenly materialized. The idea was to build super strong silos that would need almost a direct hit to destroy them. Then, instead of deliberately spacing them out, as in earlier basing schemes, the trick was to pack them very close together. This meant that incoming warheads would have to explode close together and would blow each other up before they could blow up the silos. When the attack was over, the surviving missiles would rise up through the debris and fire back. The idea, called Dense Pack, had the enormous attraction, compared to the Carter plan, of taking up a strip of land just one mile by 14. So it had the advantage of seemingly pleasing everyone. It was survivable, it was clever, uh, it was cheap, and it didn't take up much land. Uh, the only problem was that, as near as we could tell, uh, it might not work. Unfortunately for the administration, a majority of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was also afraid Dense Pack might not work when the plan was presented to Congress. 
three recommended not proceeding with it at this time with one making the qualification to say that uh, if it if it was believed that it would help uh, move the arms control negotiations recommended go going ahead with it it is not perfect and uh, we are not aware of any mode that is perfect the public's got the idea that this is a boondoggle a rube goldberg the dense pack basing mode is in in deep political trouble so deep was dense pack's political trouble that even a last minute appeal by the president at a senate republican christmas party could not sell the scheme to an increasingly skeptical congress that we make now i won't take this opportunity at a social gathering like this to twist your arms much i'll just tell you now that we can look each other in the eye the MX system is needed. But needed for what? A House-Senate conference confirmed Congress's opinion that the MX was for deterrence and must be survivable, and again refused funding unless it was. 1982 ended with the MX all but dead. 1983 began with a mood of deep frustration at the White House. There had to be some place to put the MX that Congress would buy. But the legislation gave the administration only three months to find it. In desperation, the White House established a bipartisan commission, defense experts from both parties. Give you some action in this, rather than waiting, I will sign the executive order which creates this commission. It was headed by retired General Brent Scowcroft. We're official. My notion was that, that the task was to find a decent burial for the MX because I was dubious that a solution to the problem could be found. But then gradually as we got into it, uh, it didn't look quite so hopeless. The commission may have been bipartisan, but its members all agreed the MX should be built if only to end the long years of wrangling. As to how it should be based, tests of the launch system were going well, and there just seemed no alternative to putting the missile in the silos it had been designed for. So the task now was to justify silo basing after years of arguments that it would be destabilizing. Commission witness Al Carnesale. We have so many weapons of so many different kinds deployed in so many ways that the notion that the Soviets would launch a first strike because they could get some tiny fraction of them, namely these MXs, is silly. We were talking about deploying, imagine 100 MXs. That would be 1,000 nuclear warheads. The United States has about 12,000 nuclear warheads directed at the Soviet Union. If they could get that 1,000 that are in the MX silos, they still have another 11,000. They're going to be headed at the Soviet Union. We only have about 20% of our nuclear warheads in our land-based ICBM force. The rest are at, on bombers and cruise missiles and at sea. And those are the long-range weapons that can reach the Soviet Union. So these people had the argument right in that it does undermine stability by putting MXs in silos but by very, very little in a scenario that's very unrealistic. But if the scenario is unrealistic today, the Commission saw some danger of its materializing tomorrow, once Soviet submarines get accurate missiles. With only a 15-minute flight time, sub-launched missiles could conceivably catch both the U.S. bomber force and its ICBMs in a lightning first strike, leaving the entire burden of deterrence on the U.S. submarine force. To hedge against this prospect, the Commission recommended developing a new missile, truly mobile this time, small enough to be carried continuously around military reservations on its own launcher. With only one or two warheads, the so-called Midget Man would be both harder to hit and much less valuable a target than the bigger silo-based MX. The final Scowcroft recommendations were build 100 MX missiles, not enough themselves to pose a first strike threat, and put them in silos, develop the Midget Man, and, through arms control, try to achieve a more stable balance of forces with the Soviet Union. There was something for everyone. We got 
in a political sense, uh, people who supported the MX would accept the small missile as a way to get the MX. People who didn't like the MX but liked the small missile but would accept the MX because of the small missile. And people who perhaps w didn't feel any modernization was necessary, but in order to get the Reagan administration active in arms control would support a strategic modernization. So that from a purely political sense, uh, it was that kind of a combination which got a variety of different coalitions together. Perhaps the most important member of the coalition was a somewhat reluctant Secretary of Defense. I wasn't happy with some of the recommendations. I was happy with the fact that they endorsed completely the entire modernization plan of the President and said that it should proceed and that we should put the MX in, in existing silos, that it was vitally necessary to do this and do it as quickly as possible. That's the part I like. But then they said the political realities are that in order to do this, you have to satisfy the small missile people. So after you do all of these things with the, that the president recommended, then in order to get some votes, you've got to give the, uh, the small missile people what they wanted. And I thought that was pretty silly. On May 24th, 1983, the House debated the Scowcroft Compromise. What was the um, reason we needed an MX missile system? We needed mobility. What do they plan to do with the MX missile system? Make it stationary. Make your own jokes. It is not just the MX in a basing mode. It's a combination of an MX, a small missile, a new arms control. This is a different thing. The compromise passed. Almost a decade after the MX was conceived, its production was approved. Three weeks later, the MX flew for the first time in a faultless test. But almost immediately, the political compromise that gave birth to the missile began to fall apart. Congress, far from happy with the silo basing, capped production at 50 missiles, unless, once again, a survivable basing mode could be found. The Air Force, faced with the same old problem, revived an old favorite, a train to be kept parked on air bases and sent out onto the nation's railroads in times of crisis. The train would move about the rail system or be secretly stopped in various locations. And if the president chose to launch one of these missiles, the top would come up, the missile would erect, and the crew would launch the missile. What the Air Force would like is as many MXs as it can get deployed as cheaply as possible. Their first choice would be to put them in Minuteman silos. If those civilians and members of Congress who are so concerned about vulnerability will not permit them to do that, the Air Force is essentially saying, well, how will you let me deploy them? You want them on hay wagons? I'll put them on hay wagons. You want them in trains? I'll put them on trains. If they have to be on trains, I prefer they be on trains that don't move, because that would be cheaper. Meanwhile, work on Midget Man has begun, but it's not a popular program in the Air Force. Unlike the MX, it hasn't much bang for the buck. The 50 MXs approved by Congress are now deployed in converted Minuteman silos in Wyoming, added to the almost 1,000 missile Minuteman force that remains the backbone of the U.S. land-based deterrent. The future of both the Midget Man and the rail-based MX, very different solutions to the missile vulnerability problem, lies with the new administration. The story of the MX is the story of a clash between competing philosophies, between those who believe nuclear war is best deterred by being prepared to fight one, and those who believe that deterrence is served best by making nuclear war unwinnable. The MX finally pleased no one. Not enough MX warheads are deployed to give the U.S. even a theoretical edge in a limited nuclear war. And the missile's current vulnerability would make it an early victim should nuclear war begin. The 50 MX missiles now buried beneath the Wyoming range 
despite their awesome power, have become almost a strategic irrelevancy, a legacy from an earlier nuclear age. Step three. A4, A5, A6, SD, fault warning lights illuminated and reset. They are illuminated. I am resetting now. Okay. They reset. Step 34, printouts checked. MCG test go, MSDL test go. Okay, we've got them. Flight address select switch is off. Okay, flight address is off. Okay, launch option required number. Okay, I've got the required number set. Target select is one. One is set. Time selector is IPIC. Got infinite nine, five, nine, five, nine. 39 and 40 are NA. Step 41, report results to job control. Required if any irregularities, what was your comp count? No irregularities, and the comp count was zero. OK, this uh, checklist is complete. It is completed. This program was produced by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for war and peace in the nuclear age was provided by the Annenberg CPB project. Additional funding was provided by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies for over 100 years providing business and personal insurance worldwide through independent agents and brokers and by the W. Walton Jones Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, public television stations, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. War and Peace in the Nuclear Age is a college course with textbooks published by Alfred A. Knopf. For information about the television course and related video cassettes, books, and off-air taping rights, Call the Annenberg CPB project at 1 800 Learner. The companion book to War and Peace in the Nuclear Age is now available, written by John Newhouse and published by Alfred A. Knopf. The 512 page hardcover can be ordered by calling 1 800 441 3000. 2495 plus handling. Please have your credit card ready. Can we find a defense against nuclear weapons to free us from the balance of terror? We embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. The politics, the dreams, and the doubts behind the search for Reagan's shield next time on 